sponsored by the Securities and Exchange Commission of Nigeria. Hi and welcome to Ion Nigeria's Capital Markets. I'm Wally Famarewa and thank you very much for joining me. On today's program, we bring you news around mergers and acquisitions in Nigeria and bring you the stories of deal making that is creating investments in Africa's largest economy. For centuries, mergers have been a key catalyst behind the emergence of many of the world's largest international companies. In Nigeria, attempts by local firms to expand and the entry of foreign investors have led to a sharp rise in these transactions. 44% of M&A deals approved by Nigeria Securities and Exchange Commission since 1982 have been completed in the last four years alone. Most of the M&A transactions have been regulatory um, induced, particularly by the CBN. The regulatory actions um, include the reversal of the universal banking model, which required banks to divest from, from their non-core banking activities. This action affected uh, mostly stockbroking firms, insurance companies, assets management companies, and some mortgage companies. And another um, regulatory action again by the CBN is a recapitalization of uh, the primary mortgage institutions, mm. um, which uh, required that uh, mortgage banks uh, uh, recapitalize from 100 million to the tune of 5 billion naira if they want to operate um, nationally or 2.5 billion if they want to operate within the state. The only institution in Nigeria that has the mandate to approve mergers and acquisition in Nigeria is the Securities and Exchange Commission. And that applies to both public companies and private companies, whether a company is quoted on the exchange or is not quoted on the exchange. Um, such application must come to SEC and we must grant approval before such company can, can, can actually go ahead. In the last 12 months, there's been several um, applications. Some of them we have already approved. Some of them, my colleagues, are going through them. We also witnessed transactions uh, in, um, in other sectors, like the consumer goods sectors, like the breweries. A lot of the um, breweries we had in the past were moribund. Uh, therefore, a lot of um, foreign companies came in and uh, acquired them you know, with a view to resuscitating them, as it relates to uh, flour meals, you know, related products. You had the Tiger brand of uh, South Africa coming in to acquire some, um, some portion in a, a Dangote flour. The development of the market has been very positive. We see more and more activity year on year and certainly we see um, a, a very rapidly growing amount of interest uh, in uh, entering uh, the Nigerian market and the African market in general. There's been a lot of activity uh, in the oil and gas space and power. And of course, those have been driven in the power sector by the privatization of the uh, former PHCN assets, which were sold in the first round. The total value of those deals, the assets that were sold was about $2 billion. Uh, there's been a second round, which is the sale of uh, the NI government stake uh, in the NIPP assets, and those have been valued at about uh, three billion plus, total being about five billion. So that generated, you know, a lot of deals. In the oil and gas space, uh, a number of the IOCs, uh, the Conoco Phillips of this world, and and Shell and Chevron have been divesting, you know, their um, both their offshore and onshore assets. So the number of M&As is on the rise, and dramatically so. But it still pales in comparison when stacked against the level of activity in Nigeria's pairs on the continent. When you look at the size of the M&A market, um, uh, not specifically in Nigeria, but in Africa, outside of South Africa and North Africa, um, as a percentage of GDP, you'll see that it's still a very nascent uh, market. If you look at like the size of the economy, we, we talk about about 520 billion based on the rebased numbers. and. In 2013 alone, we saw only about $2.1 billion of reported M&A deals. Um, those numbers don't seem to go hand in hand together. And, um, but that doesn't mean that we're not seeing progress from where we're coming from. So we're seeing more progress, we're seeing more and more 
deal activity but a lot of the deals we're seeing are not day-to-day -day type m a deals so we don't see a company for example say a first bank say oh we're not strong in this part of the country on this product and therefore maybe diamond bank is strong there we should go acquire them and and just bring them under our umbrella when you look at the established markets as far as m a is concerned so let's think of europe the the us um you have huge capital markets you have stock exchanges that have in some cases, hundreds of companies um, worth many hundreds of billions of dollars. And you know, when you look at M&A markets, they're generally what we call public M&A markets, i.e. Uh, a company taking over or merging with another company that's listed. And, and generally, uh, that's the bedrock of the, of the M&A market, the public M&A markets. In Africa, you simply don't have the same relative size of, of stock exchanges. So we, you know, th there simply aren't the same number of targets and acquirers within Africa itself. Nigeria is still dominated uh, by the small and medium scale enterprise businesses, the pop and mom shops, um, you know, the sole proprietorships, if you will. And when you look at that, those category of businesses, uh, change of control is, you know, is usually not favorably considered uh, compared to more established institutions where you have a proper strong corporate governance. So there is the issue of the form of the business and the size of the business. Uh, that is the first thing. So um, there's still a much a cultural aversion to parting with uh, ownership even when you look at things as basic as land for instance there's a cultural element to holding on to assets and, and not selling um, the second thing is most industries in nigeria um, save for uh, banking for instance um, downstream oil and gas uh, telecom and more specifically voices that are relatively mature industries when you look at a lot of sectors in nigeria it's still very much early stage and what that means is that going the greenfield option sometimes um, relative to an acquisition does not seem to be a very bad idea because if I'm to acquire a business where I can ramp up very quickly, start a new business, a greenfield today and I can almost catch up with an existing player in a few years, then the prospect of doing an acquisition becomes less attractive. Um, of course, related to that as well is barriers to entry, where you have sectors where barriers to entry are very low and you can pick up a license or you can set up a business, then increasingly it reduces the attractiveness of an acquisition as a means to growing your business. For the local buyers, a lot of it is number one financing. They don't have ready access to financing to complete a lot of the transactions they would want to. And then um, also you find out that a lot of the companies that they would want to actually buy, um, they can't execute those transactions because of perspective, perspective of the buyers in terms of value, in terms of the importance of the business. And for the foreign entities, a lot of what you'll see is uh, they have governance issues and worries about the risk and they can't necessarily um, measure the risk the way people here can. For you to have deals, you need to have companies that are deal worthy, right? And then you need to have buyers. Um, number one problem is that we don't really have a, a big pipeline of um, companies that people want to necessarily buy. You know, um, unlike a lot of other developed economies where you have companies growing, you know, new startups they growing every day that become mid-tier companies, you don't have a lot of that because um, one, you don't have enough companies having the management capability and then even where there is a management cap capability there's not enough access to finance and for those businesses to grow. What you'll see is that as the stock exchanges grow uh, both in value but much more importantly in the number of companies uh, that are listed and the number of different um, um, sectors that those companies uh, play in you'll see an increase in that. So, so today, outside of South Africa, most of the M&A we, we, we discuss in, in Africa is actually private. It's, it's effectively private equity. The capital market creates like a, a, a level playing field for people to buy and sell companies. So you find out that if a company has made it to the capital markets, um, the, first of all, from the perspective of risk and from the perspective of um, people holding on to that company, there's already some de-risking done. And so it's easier for buyers and sellers to talk when a company is already on the capital markets. The more companies that can grow and that we can get to the capital markets, the better for M&A. Uh, people have suggested that uh, we, have, we may have cultural issues where people tend to want to own their own businesses and so we're not 
as responsive uh, as you'll find in more developed markets uh, to uh, normal deal flow in mergers and acquisitions. And, and, and my view is different. My view is uh, that as we develop our structuring capacity, um, uh, that you know, as our um, issuing houses and corporate finance and investment banking experts start to focus on the real economy, uh, that what you will see is that uh, they'll start to say, where is the value coming in? They will then start to meet their corporate finance clients and say, what about these opportunities for you to come together? What about these opportunities for you to focus on your core business um, and, uh, and, 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 and maybe divest of other areas? Lagos and Johannesburg listed oil giant Orlando is no stranger to M&A. The company recently completed the largest all cash acquisition in the history of Nigeria's capital market. Rwando bought out the onshore oil assets of US oil producer ConocoPhillips at a price of $1.6 billion. The strategy of Rwando was diversification. Uh, the base of Rwando, if you recall, uh, from many years was a downstream business uh, with a supply and trading arm. And Rwando has through the years identified that the structure uh, and its, its capacity as a company uh, could also be deployed into other areas and started the program very many years ago of diversification um, and that diversification took us into the gas and power uh, arena, um, the EMP arena with producing assets and exploration assets and also the oil field services arena. So that is what drove Oando to the diversification. Now specifically for the acquisition of ConocoPhillips' interest, it was because it fitted with a strategy of growth by getting producing assets and a large reserve base and assets that were close to production, where we could cost, uh, you know, by investing in it, get uh, significant growth potential. We've been uh, doing a lot of acquisitions and, and, and you know, from the rigs that have been bought to the structures, um, the divestments in some cases uh, in our gas and power division. Um, so Oanda as a company has significant experience in mergers and acquisitions. We actually many times like to think of ourselves as the most capable in M&A. Um, and this does not speak to even the ones that we went into and chose not to conclude or did not win. An interesting story is the Oanda story. Um, Initially, they acquired Unipetrol and then Ajip merged both, uh, both businesses to create Owando. And from a simple downstream business that was struggling, they built one of the largest oil and gas businesses um, in, in, in the region with, you know, operations in a range of, you know, segments of the oil and gas value chain then downstream, upstream services. And it's a very, you know, interesting, you know, story from that perspective. And if you look across sectors, there are a number of, of, of strong stories like that. So it's, it's the kind of, of, of value those types of transactions create. If we define smaller transactions as, let's say, between 25 and $75 million, I think there's huge potential uh, for that market. Um, I think that's going to be driven primarily by the consumer growth that everybody is talking about. That consumer growth is creating companies and those companies need growth capital to keep up with the growth in demand. And I think from a private equity perspective, that's certainly where the private equity players are, are interested because they will be focused on finding companies that require growth capital that can scale very effectively if they receive that growth capital. The time is ripe. Uh, we at SEC are certainly uh, reviewing the past uh, transactions, trying to understand what's driving them. Uh, we're also reviewing our regulation to see how we can make sure that our regulation is much more supportive uh, of mergers and acquisitions. But I do think that the real area of focus is for our investment banks, our corporate finance experts, to start uh, to focus more closely on the real sector and see how they can help the real sector create value and basically benefit from what we're seeing, which is foreign firms looking into Nigeria, looking at how they can acquire businesses that already exist because they then have to go through the traditional learning uh, and therefore uh, be able to just hit the ground running. When we come back, we continue our focus on mergers and acquisitions in Nigeria. Don't go anywhere.
Attempting a merger or acquisition deal in Nigeria is an adventure with an uncertain outcome. Even the most attractive companies can sometimes be full of surprises uncovered only after a deal is done. This is a key risk in m and that is discouraging potential deal makers. You buy a lemon and you cut it open and realize that it's an apple you bought. Um, the truth is there are ways to mitigate these, these, these challenges. Um, at the end of the day, the, the quality of the deal for you if you're buying an asset is a reflection of the quality of the due diligence you do. Um, it cannot be overemphasized that it's required that you do as thorough a review of the legal, finance, tax and commercial considerations of any entity you're looking to buy. Um, and as thorough as you do that due diligence, the next side to that is how you translate that into um, transaction agreement. You know, you, you've got to do your due diligence. It, it sometimes looks easy from outside in to say, oh, I can make I can get more value out of this coming, but when you get in and you have to deal with the day-to-day -day issues, it's not necessarily the same. Um, you know, it, it's always, the grass is always greener on the other side. So I think you need to be sure that you have the competence, first of all, to go in and win in that market that that company is playing in. You need to be sure that you can actually translate those assets into value. And then also you need to be sure that um, you've done your due diligence and there are no claims on the things that, already prior claims on the things you're going in there for. Risk aside, M&A deals are often game changers for perceptive investors. The former Standard Trust Bank, previously run by Nigerian entrepreneur Tony Elumelu, moved into the top tier of Nigeria's banking sector when it merged with UBA in 2005. The bank has since expanded into 19 African countries. Nigerian financial institutions have become significant players in the financial space across Africa investing everywhere from Senegal, uh, you know, across to Kenya, down to Mozambique. Uh, and so that's becoming, the, the sort of intra-African m and is becoming a more and more important part of the, um, of the market. The STB-UBA deal was driven primarily by regulatory changes in Nigeria's banking sector. But some investment bankers say that the current valuation of companies in Nigeria's stock market could provide fresh opportunities to smart investors. It's a very good time uh, to acquire business in Nigeria today uh, for a number of reasons. The first thing being uh, the valuations. Valuations are, you know, are pretty modest. They've been, you know, over the past few years, the market has never quite recovered to the level of pre-2008 days. Um, so, you know, a lot of companies are trading less than book and there is a high probability of getting a good deal on a company today, particularly where you have dissatisfied shareholders, where, you know, dividends haven't been very consistent and uh, the, the, the share price haven't appreciated as, as projected. So it's a very good time to scan the market. There is um, a lot of value that partnering with a large structured entity or the right kind of financial sponsor brings to helping you build out, you know, your corporate governance structure. And I think beyond just the now, helping you fix your corporate governance prepares you for, a broad, for, for building out a larger business. Before businesses come to market, and we've seen interesting transactions happen um, more recently, the dual listing of CEPLAT on the Nigerian and the um, London Stock Exchange, there was preparation that went into getting to that point and there's a lot of good work that had to go into place to set up corporate governance ETC and you know that is the kind of value that a partner, um, the right kind of partner can bring to you at that stage. Seplat is an oil company with a rich history in M&A. The company was formed in 2009 to facilitate the acquisition of oil assets from Total, Shell, and ENI. Several other acquisitions have followed Seplat's first deal. Majors and acquisition is one of the three planks of our growth uh, as, uh, aspiration and strategy. Uh, and we, we've stated it severally. We're growing our existing assets organically and we're looking very uh, actively in acquiring more assets to grow our production to grow our reserves and to look at exploration opportunities. When people think a lot about m and it's more because even if they have the funding to be able to grow organically, 
they can get to that point faster via an m and M&A transaction. So take the Amcom banks that are being sold, for example. Um, we understand that there are several banks that are bidding for some of these Amcom banks. Let's say, for example, that a ba one of those banks can be sold for, say, um, take a number, 30 billion, uh, take a number. Any of those banks, if you give them 30 billion cash today in equity, and they'll try to go orga organically over several years, they will get there faster by buying any one of those Amcom banks than they could. Um, by growing organically. So I think that's one reason why a lot of people consider m and Also, we also see a lot of companies, especially ones that have been there for a while and are not being managed well, they have a lot of assets. So you have companies that have a lot of landed property, a lot of um, physical assets like that, or or brand, brands that are very valuable. To the extent you're able to do your due diligence on the entity and see the opportunity to actually manage the risk there and then grow faster, M&As are worth it. Another example of a company spotting an opportunity in Nigeria's stock market is CBO Capital. Last year, the private equity and investment management company acquired a 15% stake and options to purchase a controlling interest in the NSE-listed Union Daikon Salt Company. Piling up losses for many years, this salt manufacturer appeared to have a bleak future. Investors behind CBO Capital identified value that could be tapped with the injection of fresh capital and a new perspective. CBO Capital directors who declined to participate in this report to maintain confidentiality until certain aspects of the deal are completed, have announced plans to transform Union Daikon from a mere salt company to a world-class agribusiness and food processing company by providing much-needed funding and access to partnerships that can accelerate growth. It's an in interesting play um, for, for people who may not necessarily be in a particular industry, maybe do something ancillary and see you know, that there are businesses that are, you know, uh, that are interesting from a range of perspectives and potentially good deal to enter. You know, a good case study uh, of an acquisition uh, of an underperforming company which we've been involved in uh, very recently uh, is the acquisition of Oasis Insurance uh, on behalf of our client uh, FPN Insurance. So basically Oasis um, has been set up for some time. Uh, it's been trading at 50 Cobo uh, for the past few years and uh, on the other hand, our client um, had the need, you know, for to 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 go into the general insurance uh, business, and our client is part of the FPN holding uh, group. So we approached the, the majority shareholders uh, of Oasis Insurance, and they were keen to do a deal. So uh, we've been on this for for the past year or so. Um, we've succeeded in acquiring majority um, shares in the company. One concept yet to really take off in Nigeria's M&A market is hostile takeovers, where an unwilling management is pressured to do a deal. When you look at most emerging markets, you won't see um, a significant amount of, of hostile M&A activity. Um, and I think the principal reason for that is that uh, emerging markets companies tend to be driven by either strong individuals, entrepreneurs who have set up the company, families who own and run these companies in the majority, or uh, you also have um, a significant presence of, of multinationals. To be able to get those shares, if the route you're going down is trying to acquire the shares, is either via a tender offer or you go actually to, um, to, to buy the shares off the market. The challenge with doing a tender offer in a market like Nigeria is simple. There's a lot of shareholder apathy um, in putting the notice in the paper and trying to get people to come and, because people have to come and offer you their shares on, in a tender offer. And that will be difficult to do because of shareholder apathy here. Um, the other challenge is if you decide to go and buy the shares on the floor of the market, the simple effect is it's going to drive off the share price. And I would imagine that whoever is trying to do the takeover, it will probably at some point become uneconomical um, for you to, to push the transaction. It's hard for, for you to do things quietly here. 
Um, once you start buying shares on the exchange, it becomes obvious. People are asking questions, who's buying? And there's no way to do it quietly. Um, the top players are, if, are, are you know, few in number. And so it would, it would come out eventually what you're trying to do. And I think once the cat is out of the bag, then you know, the transaction is a bust. Another thing that is going to happen that I think will s make us see more on friendly deals is that you have a lot more institutional investors becoming bigger shareholders in many companies today. A lot of institutional investors don't have sentimental ties to companies. It's more about value. So to the extent a hostile buyer can come and give them value, more often than not, they're willing to take that value and go invest it elsewhere. So the more a company has institutional investors or investors that are just tied to financial value, the easier it is for you to see unfriendly deals taking place. The appetite for m and in Nigeria is growing. Over the last 12 months, historically large transactions linked to strategic shifts in the structure of Nigeria's oil industry have been completed. Meanwhile, regulatory changes are driving deals across the financial sector. The rapid growth of the banking sector over the last decade confirms that M&A in Nigeria can create value. As more deals get done, the smart money will identify companies that can add value, creating prosperity for local and foreign investors. Wale Famrewa, CNBC Africa.